This is the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, a podcast brought to you by two physical therapists devoted to helping physical therapists and other healthcare providers become better educators to patients, students, the community, and each other by interviewing prominent and passionate people within the realms of healthcare and education. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast is intended literally for educational and entertainment purposes only. No clinical decision-making should be based on only one source, and therefore this podcast should not be used as personal medical advice. While care has been taken to ensure accuracy, occasionally mistakes and factual errors can be present, as we are only human. This is our journey on the road to becoming better educators, so get ready with your pen and paper as class is about to begin. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Pollan, and as always, I'm joined by my other co-host, F. Scott Veal. And today we're bringing you the one and only Sturdy McKee for a discussion into the realm of telehealth for healthcare providers. Now, for those of you who don't know who Sturdy is, Sturdy is a business coach, entrepreneur, and business owner who also happens to be a physical therapist and private practice owner. Sturdy brings the practical knowledge of owning, operating, and growing businesses combined with extensive training and learning to clients who want to improve their business operations and achieve their personal and business goals. Surti created and taught Clinician University, a two-day business crash course for clinician client owners and operations executives. Attendees of this two-day course realized an average increase in revenue of 8.9% in the first three months following attending with the top of the range at 22%. Sturdy is the father of three wonderful children and lives in San Francisco with his wife, Kathy. He is on the board of EO San Francisco and is the CEO and co-founder at San Francisco Sport and Spine Physical Therapy, ScheduleDoc.co, and Major League Orthopedics. Sturdy is also a member of the private practice section of the American Physical Therapy Association and serves on the private practice section's Impact Magazine editorial board. So Sturdy... Thanks so much for coming on the show today. And, you know, I realize that there's a lot more that you've done throughout your career that I didn't mention in this brief bio, but was there anything that you'd like our listeners to know about you that I didn't mention? Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Scott, for having having me on, number one. And I don't know, the introduction seems, I'm not quite sure I deserve it, but <laughs> so I'm not sure there's much to add other than what I'm really excited about and what I what motivates me at this stage of the game is to help other business owners and help them succeed, reach their goals, and really have a better understanding of their businesses and avoid some of the mistakes, as many as we can help them with, avoid those mistakes that we've made. Yes, yeah, Sturdy, do you think you could tell our listeners a little bit about your journey into how you became a business owner, entrepreneur, and business coach? Sure. I. So it's interesting because for me anyway, to look back, because I think I've always been something of an entrepreneur. And I was just thinking last night, I was irritated with one of my wonderful children, as parents are sometimes, and just thinking about how do we teach more responsibility? How do we work? And I was thinking about it at, at 12 years old, you know, I was probably already on my second business. I was mowing lawns, had purchased my own mower, was going out and, you know, learning to sell my services and and all that kind of stuff. And then that, that you know, looking back, there were other instances of those types of ventures and things all along the way for me. And I, even in grad school and PT school, I was like buying and selling antiques and doing other stuff. I had a payphone business at one point, but it never occurred to me that I was an entrepreneur or that that was a thing. And that's really where EO Entrepreneurs Organization comes in because, you know, after, so kind of along those lines, I always knew I wanted to start a private practice. There were some things that happened at UCSF when I worked there after graduation, but worked there several years later with a demerger with Stanford and all this stuff that went on with the hospital that I went out on my own as a physical therapist a little earlier than I thought I would, but I always kind of knew I wanted to have my own practice. And, you know, I also am not, maybe some people can resonate with this, but I'm not the greatest employee. I have ideas and opinions and not, you know, not just ideas and opinions, but I've, I feel pretty strongly about ways things can get done and want to, you know, really drive and make decisions and move forward sometimes faster, sometimes in a different direction from others. So that that lends itself again to kind of going out on your own and taking some of those risks and stuff. But anyway, I, you know, I went out and opened my own practice and then realized uh, what, how much we didn't know about business, how much I didn't know, how much there was yet to learn. 
and really started working on the business after after a couple of years. So this wasn't like you know three weeks in realizing, oh my gosh, we gotta go do this. It, this was struggling through working long hours, seeing a lot of patients, knowing we were providing great clinical care, building relationships, but still struggling to make ends meet. And that got really, really frustrating. And, you know, back then, we're talking 15 years ago or so, there weren't a lot of resources within the profession. We had tried to tap into as many as we could, but weren't getting the kind of results that we wanted. So went outside of PT to learn about business. And even with the first kind of crash course we took, we became we turned around to profitability like in six, six or eight weeks. And that was remarkable for me. And I was like, wow, if that if that can happen, then you know, what else is there to learn? So just became a student of the the business side of things and trying to figure out, you know, how to make things better. What are the building blocks? What are the components? And and you mentioned the board of EO, EO being an entrepreneur's organization. I'm on the board in San Francisco, but it's a global organization. And I've been a member for the past nine years and on the board for six or seven, something like that. But being in a group with other entrepreneurs, and this isn't a referral group or anything, this is peer-to-peer volunteer learning, growing, personal growth, as well as your business, but really being exposed to so many things that I didn't know about, didn't know existed. And that was how I first became exposed to to business coaching. It's how I first learned about metrics and KPIs. It's how I learned that so many other business owners and entrepreneurs deal with the very, very same things that that we do. And, you know, expanding my horizons, my world, my view was hugely instrumental to kind of the next steps in the journey, the other businesses that going into business coaching and helping others, you know, there's this running theme of trying to help other people that really motivates me. But, you know, this winding journey has a lot to do with just being exposed and seeing, you know, more of the world, more opportunities, more possibilities that I just simply didn't know existed before. Yeah, no, I think that's a great take, Serdi. And I really respect, and I think that's a really important takeaway in that the power of kind of finding a good group that kind of has a similar mission, but have some different perspective for kind of some collaboration is so enriching to not only personal development, but professional development, as I feel that, you know, we're seeing more of those take place. And I feel like, honestly, that's where I kind of get the most development and the most advancement forward. So I think that's a really good take for that one. Sturdy, for our audience of healthcare providers and students who are perhaps not sure about the topic that we're going to be talking about this evening, which is telehealth, how would you go about defining what telehealth is? You know, Brandon, this is an interesting question because I think the first, you know, the when I thought about this the first time, I was thinking about, you know, telehealth platforms and video chat and kind of that whole Skype type of interface where you're looking at each other. But, you know, thinking a little bit more about it, it goes way beyond that. You know, there is the video chat piece of things, but there's also asynchronous telehealth. There's there's the telephone. <laughs> what, what on on Wikipedia they reference Alexander Graham Bell as being the first user of telehealth when he calls Watson in to help him with the acid he spilled on his on his pants. So I, I think the definition really might be a lot broader than than what at least I initially thought of. And I think it's encompassed by all those things we just talked, I just mentioned, but also internet of things and monitoring and, uh, you know, we talk about telemetry, but now we can get into telemetry at the home or, or other places, monitoring services that are, you know, beneficial and help keep people out of the hospital. There, there there's so many facets to this that, you know, and it's such a new nascent world and environment that I'm not sure I can totally define it other than someone not being right there in the room with you. Yeah, that's a pretty uh, broad take on it, Sturdy, there, but I think it fits. And tell us a little bit about what really piqued your interest and what started your inquiry into telehealth. Yeah, thanks, Scott. It's Well, so my take, I, I think a lot of people think about tech and and I, I get feedback and, and, and stuff from people, or I think it really about being in San Francisco and, and the nature of that. And you know, when I'm traveling, like, oh, well, yeah, but you're in, you're in SF and you do this and that. I think that's kind of true around kind of the entrepreneurial culture and, and, and the way people look at that aspect of things. I think it's also somewhat true about tech, but I think the assumption or the, what I've kind of seen reflected back to me is, oh, well, you're into this because of the, the tech exposure and stuff that you have. That's actually not how I came to be interested in this. Yeah, the technology aspects are certainly there, and yes, we tend to be open to those tools and stuff. At least I am 
over the years. I'm not sure that how much that has to do with geography or not. But I really came to it more from the patient perspective, and you know, the idea of considering what are what are we offer in any business, right? But but in 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 physical therapy in, a, in an outpatient ortho clinic. Um, what are the obstacles for the patient to to gaining access to care? And it's not just monetary, you know, it's time, it's driving, it's inconvenience, it's getting out of work, it's all these other aspects, all these other things that people have to overcome. And it's not just financial either. I think we think about a lot of times the cost or, or, or what have you, but but there's a time cost, there's a disruption cost, there's a leaving work cost, there's, you know, the literal pain sometimes that people are going through, all, all this other stuff that just snowballs into it. And looking at it from that aspect and thinking about, well, so how do we make that experience better? How do we improve it? How do we remove obstacles? How do we improve convenience? How do we maintain that high touch, you know, personal nature of what we do? And looking at this kind of model, I think think it can be hugely valuable and remove a lot of the barriers. You know, they, people don't have to drive to access you to do this. And you can schedule at different times. And there, there are a ton of benefits, probably m- more on the patient customer, you know, user side than the provider side. But if we're really patient centric and we're really thinking about what's in their best interest, then I don't see how we can't start to consider this or or something in the complex of telehealth as a possible component or option to what we do. Yeah, Sturdy, I think you make a real a lot of great points in there. And I think even too, I mean, the technology that is available now is so vast and advanced compared to what it was. And I think, you know, I agree. I think that leveraging that in the best way that we can to best help patients in this way, shape, or form definitely seems like something that should be pursued and is being kind of pursued. And I think that's really important to kind of gather from the patient perspective is that's really kind of what healthcare is all about is about the patient. But, you know, I'm going to switch gears here just a little bit and kind of focus more on the provider perspective. So, you know, Sturdy, as we know that there are many pressing issues within healthcare across all healthcare providers, including, but of course, you know, not limited to decreasing reimbursement from insurance, resulting in increased patient volumes, financial strain, increased costs for healthcare for patients, provider debt from education, increased documentation requirements for, for providers, which can lead to burnout lack of integration of technology and healthcare, and, and there's many more. But based on what you have seen, what role has telehealth played, or do you think it will play in regards to reducing some of these problems in healthcare? I think we're all focused on access. And, you know, access comes at different places, different levels. But I, what I really think is going to happen with this is it's going to continue to reduce barriers. It's going to continue to provide access to to people with knowledge. I think it's going to take a lot of forms in the future as well, where, you know, instead of, or maybe as a preliminary to accessing an actual provider, people might be connected to a computer and AI might serve parts of this as well. So we're getting into a, a scale potential that that can augment or help or, you know, take some of the burden off the providers. Because even with this you know, as things are now, people come into a clinic or in an office, they wait, and then they're really bottlenecked based on the provider's time. I don't think there's much of a difference the way we might think about this vis-a-vis the, the provider's time. I still have the same amount of finite time. I still have to do, you know, X, Y, Z. We still have to communicate and ask those questions. So I think there are ways that you can speed up some of that process, and maybe there'll be some triage and intake and stuff that's done in more of an automated fashion. But I think it's really, really back to the patient. I know there are other benefits, you know, outside of the realm of physical therapy. I think this could probably help tremendously with uh, population health. You know, there, what was it? I was looking at the National Telehealth Policy Resource Center, for example, says a, a 30-day readmissions following cardiac events where telehealth or in populations where telehealth is is implemented and provided uh, readmissions have uh, gone down from 20% to 40% or to 4% rather 20% to 4% in the first 30 days and you know I start to think about that I was uh, as I read that I was thinking well what are the implications for a a cardiac rehab program that's run more like Peloton you know where where you've got people in their own homes doing their own thing and they're being monitored and watched and led 
centrally without without the overhead, without the footprint, without the facility to have 50 people, you know, and, and all the expense that goes with that. So I think there are a ton of potential possibilities and the role is only going to expand. And, you know, you mentioned in decreasing reimbursements and, and all that kind of stuff. I, I think, well, I get a little bit passionate about different kind of models and, and what folks do, but they're basically three value disciplines in business. And, and just real briefly, they are operational excellence, product leadership, and customer intimacy. And operational excellence is really that idea of serving a lot of people at a low margin on a, on a vast scale. So Walmart, UPS, FedEx, th- Amazon. So things that really are relying upon logistics and moving a lot of product or a lot of service and that type of thing. Product leadership is, has been exemplified in, in the recent history by Apple. And then there's also Tesla and their delivery models too, like Airbnb and Uber and Lyft and, and all that. But then customer intimacy, I think, is really where we reside or we want to reside as healthcare providers and clinical people. We want to and we tend to customize our prescriptions, if you will, our decision making, our plans. We take pride in that. We take pride in the relationships and the connections that we make and the impact we have on people. And in other industries, you're you're talking more about high touch more customized options, the Ritz-Carlton, Nordstrom, those types of, th- of, of companies are really more focused on high touch per- versus volume on the, on the customer intimacy component. And where I see a huge disconnect in, in, in our thinking as well as the industry is insurance companies, and we'll call them that because uh, I have more to say about that in a minute, but they and many hospitals, and not all of them, but a lot of the bigger entities are really focused on the operational excellence type model. And that really puts us in a situation where they're trying to get the lowest bidder, keep their, maintain their margins through, through volume and, and, and really thinner margins and what have you. And that ends up impacting all of us. And they don't see the point in paying for something that's a higher level service, higher care, you know, more time with the provider and that type of thing. They simply want to get people in and out. And, and there's a big disconnect between where what most of us want to provide and the playing field we find ourselves on some of the time. And I think when, when we're looking at a real patient-centric, user-centric model and trying to bring to them what's going to get them the best result, not just the quickest, fastest, most convenient, I think then you start to provide you know, better value and more value for the individual, for the end user, for the patient. And I mean, the, the beautiful thing about this is you're kind of me- meshing this up. You're using this tool that really is, I was about to say product leadership, but I'm, you know, quick Google search will show you that there are articles from 2012 and 2010 talking about the new telehealth and the five top things that are going to happen and, and all this, yet we're so slow to adopt because we're still worried about, you know, what the insurance company is going to pay for. Meanwhile, they've done an amazing job of shifting the financial responsibility both to the employers and also to the patients. So the patients are paying a lot more for really this basic level of service, whereas if we can provide that higher level, higher touch, better level of service for a marginally you know, different price, I think there are a lot of people out there that would see value in that. And especially when you start adding in the additional convenience the decreased disruption on their day-to-day lives, all those aspects, that we start taking the price point, not maybe not out of the equation, but making it a lot less impactful or a lot less important because there are so many other benefits to what you're providing. Yes, 30, I think that's a really great point. It's like Uber, right? Uber doesn't sell taxi rides. It sells time and convenience, right? And I think that's one of the problems that telehealth is trying to solve is, is that convenience that you talk about and, and breaking down some of the barriers to getting to your medical treatment. So really great points. W- one of the things that we like to do here on the podcast is play devil's advocate a little bit. So I'm going to come at you with this question. What are some of the limitations of telehealth from both a patient and provider perspective? Oh, sure. I mean, there, there are limitations. And I think it's real easy to get bogged down in that, and I and I and I hear that, you know, with providers particularly, there are these objections, right? There, well, not all my patients are online. Not all my patients can do this. I need to see the person, and and you do you do, and there's a there's a time and place 
for all of these things. Limitations, obvious limitations, are you can't put your hands on somebody. That makes it really difficult to do passive accessory motions, to do uh, stability testing, to monitor, you know, even do things like pulse, you know. But instead of focusing on the limitations, I try to focus on, well, where can things fit? And You know, this morning I got a group text from my mom that she, I hope she's okay with me sharing this, but, um, you know, she, she texted my sisters and me that, Hey, I got my MRI results back and I've got tenosynovitis or something in the tibialis posterior and that's what's going on. And, and, uh, and they're referring me to the orthopedist. So I immediately, you know, say, Hey, give me a call when you're, when you're free. And in essence, I just, without a, a, a fancy platform, just got on the cell phone, talked my mom through, you know, had her read her findings, tell me what was going on with the MRI, give her advice, tell her what she could do, explain the exercises and things that I, I thought she should do, you know, helped her with, you know, do you need to go see the orthopedic surgeon? Because it's not given what you know so far where things are, is it really a surgical case? And what are they going to do for you? And how is this going to affect, you know, the course of treatment? And and are you just going there to get a referral to PT or, or, or what? And, you know, to credit our primary care providers, they were laying all this stuff out for her too. But ultimately, you know, what, at least in my clinical opinion, and this, we're talking about my mom too, right? So I'm going to do my best job, (laughs) which, you know, I think we all, we all should, you know, with everybody, but, you know, I think it's important that we, we think of people that way and try to give them the best possible service can all the time. But, you know, so for my mother anyway, really thinking about what she needs, giving her some instruction. And then it wasn't a half hour later that my, my dad ends up texting me two short videos and asking, is she doing it right? Which was perfect, right? Because my first response, you know, number two was perfect. Number one, try to keep your knee still, you know, and, and there you are with the visual feedback and stuff. So I think there's a lot that we can do. And if we take ourselves out of what we're used to doing, all the time, we can start to go, okay, yeah, certainly there are limitations, but I get a call from a family member. I get a call from a friend and they ask me about, you know, their kid who just got hurt on the soccer field. I'm going to answer that question and ask questions and try to do the best I can. And then, of course, refer them to someone if it looks like they need that or it's, you know, some things are more serious or or there are things that we can't test and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, use our best clinical judgment. Yes, it's your license. You want to be conservative and protective and, and and always do the best thing by your patient. But I think there's a lot more possibility here than, oh, well, what are the limitations? How can we stop? You know, what, what, are, what are the problems with this? It's important to anticipate the problems. It's important to address those. I just don't want people, you know, saying, well, well, here are the problems. Therefore, we can't pursue or do, you know, whatever the thing is, not, not just related to telehealth. Yeah, Sturdy, I think that's a really great take. And I think you brought up a lot of important aspects to really consider, especially regarding some of the limitations with telehealth, especially from, you know, lack of a visual perspective, less of being able to test certain things, you know, so maybe not be able to get a full 100%, you know, a clinical picture like we normally have in a clinic. But sometimes I'm always realizing too that not all patients need that. And depending on where where the patient's coming from, what kind of things they need, if they're looking for a follow-up. But, you know, I'm going to kind of switch gears here on, ask one question that I kind of thought of off the script here. And so how would you find figure is kind of the best way to really work on developing a system that kind of works on separating people that you think would be appropriate for telehealth and those that won't. So like when a patient contacts the clinic, you can kind of guide those, get those questions to figure out would they be better for telehealth or would they be better for a live therapist interview. And I just wondered, what is your thoughts on how to integrate that kind of into a systems approach? Sure. So I was working with a company called Physera and I'm an advisor there. They're working on a, on a telehealth platform geared toward employers and basically providing exactly what you're asking about. And it's really the same thing, excuse me, it's really the same thing that we are trying to do here in the clinic with a more of a general orthopedic population. And that is providing screens. We've even started doing some free screening with people, you know, 15 minutes on the phone if they prefer, in person if they prefer, and then also offering the the telehealth component or option if they prefer. So again, it's back to the patient. Now, to address your question a little more directly, if that's the triage point, that's the intake point, and you're kind of making that assessment, most people, I think, are going to be on more of a hybrid model. You're going to want to 
you know, see them in person, do some stuff in person, particularly if you find, oh, you know, they sprained their ankle, for example, or they're working on a shoulder issue and you haven't been able to test passive accessory motion. So you haven't been able to test uh, stability. And I'm, I'm sure that in a lot of other specialties, there are similar type things where, yeah, that would be really you know, important or useful, particularly if they haven't had imaging studies or all the rest of it. So, but if I suspect that I'm talking to somebody with an ankle sprain and I'm concerned about, about their stability, then asking them to come in for five minutes and allow, you know, allow us to do that one test while almost everything else we're going to do can be done remotely. You know, I think that I'm a little stuck on the systems approach versus the the professional clinical decision making, and I really think there needs to be a synthesis or an overlap. Or you know, the, there's a reason we all go to school for so long. There's a reason you know you before people are really considered top of their game, master clinicians. There's five, ten years of practice. You see so much stuff. You get so much experience. You work with so many people that. You know, we can create a system, but we also need to allow peop- allow the clinical staff and the patient to have a real say in that process and do what they're most comfortable with and what they really think is, is in the best interest of the individual and, and protecting them, you know, with that. I think once you've seen a person and you've got done the screen, you've done the eval and all, I think it's a huge potential adjunct. And you know, we've got patients who travel all over the world and are gone for a couple of weeks. And instead of completely interrupting their plan of care and the rehab and stuff, being able to connect with them, whether they're in Paris or Japan or whatever, and, you know, check in, make sure things are going well, give a little bit of advice, you know, and this ends up being, ironically, your telehealth platform and the video and everything else is less expensive than the phone call that you know we would have used to make and, and stuff. So I think people have to do what they're, and I mean providers, what they're comfortable with, but I would urge them to really challenge some of the discomfort as well and see if that's kind of a self-limiting thing or if that's something that they've heard about and is it fear-based or is it really about what's in the best interest of the patient? Yes, yeah, Sturdy, speaking of world travelers and other countries, I have a feeling I know the answer to this question already, but uh, is telehealth being used in different countries other than the U.S., and ha- has that seen some success? You know, I, Scott, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about that. You know, I don't know where it has seen success. What i a little bit fascinated by on the international kind of scale is not every country has the same laws we do. There are a lot of countries that don't really – like if we're talking about physical therapy, they don't have physical therapists per se, or if they do, they're not educated in practicing the same way that, you know, that we are here or, and and, and everybody, I, I hope, I think a lot of the people know that, you know, you can take a handful of countries, Australia, the UK, Denmark, and, you know, the Netherlands and, and a few others where PTs of Canada here that, that are really practicing at a at a very high level and you know are extremely well educated and provide a great service. I think there are a lot of others where if you translate PT in, in Japan, the physios don't do the same thing they do here. The education background license, all that stuff is really not not on a par. It, it's there's a translation, but it's not the same thing. It's kind of an approximation. I did some consulting in Beijing a number of years ago and there isn't real there isn't a license for physical therapists there there and there isn't really a program they're developing some of that stuff now but there are people who are educated in sports medicine and and exercise science and that type of thing who are trying to do more of this and i think we have huge potential and opportunity and most of us you know whether we're here or the uk or australia or europe or what have you haven't really thought about the potential reach and the impact that we could have by helping people in other countries. And, you know, there are a ton of countries, there are a ton of places that that could use it. Indonesia, you know, has a huge population, yet I don't think there's any, you know, kind of, there's not parity in, in what we can provide and stuff. So I think our potential reach is so much broader, so much bigger than what we think about, you know, versus a 15 mile radius around our clinic or whatever your your thoughts are. It's not just our local community. I mean, our local community can end up being halfway around the world. So I think we're still so early in the adoption phase that 
it's I would be surprised to find out that, oh, it's been super successful everywhere else but here. But I think there's so much potential to help to, to bring what we know, to bring your training, like for the PT students and the therapists and stuff that are listening, to bring your education, your training, your expertise to just a, a wide, wide potential population globally all over the world. Yes, yeah, Sergey, that's a really good take. And I think that's a really important point. I think that that, you know, would definitely help solve a lot of issues from, you know, at least from a, a global international access standpoint, because um, I think that could really be incorporated well. And you know, I thank you for that take. And, you know, I'm going to kind of switch here a little bit and kind of go back to a topic that we kind of mentioned before. But I'm just kind of curious, to your knowledge, is telehealth currently reimbursed by insurance? And, you know, do you think that insurance reimbursement route or is the way, or do you think that the cash pay route is better, or does it kind of depend on the business model? Uh, <laughs> oh, Brandon, everything depends on the business model, but ultimately the business model depends upon the people you're trying to serve, the customers, the clients, the patients. So, I mean, it's a great question. I, I just think there's probably a lot to unpack here. One, one of the thing, well, there, here are two, two soapbox things, or at least one. Number one, we're all cash. We're all getting paid cash, whether it comes through EFT from Medicare or, you know, Cigna or from a patient, you know, handwriting a check, unless you're getting paid in chickens or whatever, we're, we're cash. So who's paying, I think, is something that's really interesting. And I think there's so many potential kind of avenues and stuff there. Uh, I think we've thought of ourselves as as kind of this weird hybrid of B2B and B2C and all this stuff that I, I'm not sure that we as providers have really understood, you know, who our customer is. And I even heard that at Graham sessions a couple of years ago, someone stood up and, and adamantly slammed their foot down and said, you know, the insurance company is my customer. And, and in my mind, I was just like, Oh, God forbid, you know, the, the patient is mine and, and that's who I want to take care of. And the insurance might be an avenue um, and and supplement and augment and help, but you know even when we're talking the political climate around universal health care. We're really talking about universal health insurance. We're not talking about health care. So there there needs to be a distinction. I'm a strong believer we need to be clear on that. Another thing that's really happened that I don't think people are terribly aware of yet. I've had this conversation with you know VPs at insurance companies and stuff, and they're like, yeah, you know, and they're very proud of it. Is Many of the in, quote unquote insurance companies are no longer insurance companies. They're basically functioning as third party administrators. And if if you look at the and this is easily findable, I don't have a reference handy, but you can Google it and it's it's out there. Over seventy percent, um, getting closer to eighty percent of employees in the private sector in the United States are covered under a self-funded insurance plan. So in, in other words, the, the employer is funding the plan and then the quote unquote insurance company is acting really as a third party administrator. And what we've got is a system whereby this ease of access, the prevention models, all the things that you know people in the profession and people on like the HCSM and HCLDR hashtags and social media and stuff are talking about the the system has shifted and those incentives ought to be taken advantage of. So and, and what's end up, ending up happening is if you're if you're an employer and you make you know electronics or something else, you're not thinking that healthcare is a major part of your business. And I know Dave Chase is out there saying it is part of your business. You're actually a healthcare company in many ways, because there's such a huge proportion or huge, you know, cost associated with what you're doing. It's, it's part of your, it's a huge expense to take care of your employees that way. And yet they're still taking advice from the, the old guard who tell them they have the answers. And, and I see a real problem with that because the incentive structures that were set up for an insurance, a, a real true insurance company that took premiums, held on to the money, and then had to pay stuff out was their incentives were to not pay stuff out. They made money on the float. They invested in the bond market. They did all this stuff where it, the longer they could delay payment, the more money they made. And versus the employer who wants to take care of their employees and make sure that they 
they stay healthy, that they stay productive, that they're happy, that they're engaged, that, you know, you're taking because of a, in this employer funded model, there's less or there, I guess there should be less concern about whether, you know, you got hurt on a, a scuba diving or playing softball or at your desk. You know, it's all ending up coming out of my account as the employer. So I want to manage that population and apply best practices to that and stop taking advice from the people that are trying to ration the wrong things. You know, if we, if we inv- and every business owner knows this, every business executive knows this, if you invest money in certain places, it ends up paying huge dividends in others. The problem is they're not experts in this niche. They're experts in, in what they do, and they're getting advice from people that are trying to sell them this old stuff that worked in a different model. And meanwhile, there's this huge opportunity to just to, to flip it all on its head. So, you know, is it reimbursed by insurance? Not very much. Do I care? You know, probably even less. I, I want to get the message out to the employers that, look, you'd be much better off paying a little bit of money up front for us to, you know, triage your musculoskeletal population, offer free, you know, screens that you as the employer pay for, get people to the right provider, get them taken care of more quickly, you know, get them back to their lives, to their families, to their work, to everything quicker, you know, and then, and we haven't even started to talk about, you know, the opioid crisis and pain management, all the other kind of stuff that's out there or lifestyle diseases and cardiac and diabetes and all that other stuff. But again, this is an area where if we improve access to what you guys do, to what therapists do, to, to, you know, what the students are coming out and their education, what we can do, how we can positively impact society as a whole and companies bottom lines and all this stuff is so much more impactful than than where we've been historically worrying about whether you know blue cross or cigna or somebody is willing to pay me you know whatever dollar amount per transaction so th- thanks for letting me rage on the soapbox for a sec <laughs> <laughs> no i love it though man i think it provided a lot of good stuff and you know, and you, I kind of want to kind of follow up on that last part that you kind of really touched on in regards to, you know, teaching students a little bit more in regards to how they can, how we can really show them how we can use this to really get more access to kind of help train the next generation. Question to you here, and I realize this is probably a loaded question here, so forgive me in advance for this, but, you know, how do you think is the best way that we do teach that next generation of healthcare providers to do this? I think one of the, and I, and I don't I'm certain I don't have the answer a comprehensive answer for this. I think one of the things that can help or might help people to broaden their their horizon their the way they think about this stuff is getting back in touch regardless of whether you're graduating now or you know you did 20 years ago 20 22 years ago for me. You know, why did you become a therapist in the first place? And and it, I don't. I don't think it was to do documentation and CPT coding and argue over how many units, or whatever. You know, I. The reason most of us got into this profession or into healthcare in general is to help people. And if we go back to that and start thinking about, you know, how can I help more people, and primarily how can I bring all the stuff I've learned to the population? You know, I was about to say to the market, but it, that's that's not that's not right it's not bringing it to market we're not trying to necessarily monetize every touch point in every every area we that that's not why we went to pt school it's not why people go to medical school generally it's not why they go to nursing yeah they want security they want a good living but you know it's really it's really to help people and i think if we keep that top of mind and and we start thinking about all the things i mean this is one of the one of the cool things about PT school, three years of graduate education, a doctoral degree. For those of you who are just coming out or students, you've learned so much. You have so much to share. You have so much cool stuff that you've learned that we don't even do on a day-to-day basis necessarily in an outpatient ortho clinic or an inpatient or any one area. But think about how you can bring the things that really you know light your fire, that, that you're passionate about, to bear and bring them to more people. And this is a tool. You know, it's it's a leverage point. It's a tool to allow you to reach and help more people in the population around the world than maybe you you ever considered. Yes, 30. Let's say I'm a clinic owner 
and I'm looking to implement telehealth to my practice, right? What questions should I be asking myself before considering adding telehealth to my business? Well, Scott, I think I think the biggest question to ask is what do my patients want? And and then to actually go ask them. But instead of our own assumptions and oh, well, you know, assuming why people come to us and what have you, making an offering. I think that's back to some of the the entrepreneurial pieces and the risks and you know, I've started businesses that we offered something and nobody really wanted to buy. And, and uh, you know, you learn that the hard way. <laughs> but, but I think if you ask people, would this be a value? Would it be useful? Would you be comfortable, you know, putting it out to your current patients with whom you already have a relationship and seeing what their, what their take is? Would this, you know, just asking the question, would it be helpful if, da 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 and, you know, you're going to get all kinds of questions back, I'm sure, like like what we asked before, does insurance pay for it, is this and that, and it does or it doesn't. But again, we're not trying to substitute what we do as a business owner. We're not trying to totally change, you know, your business. What, what we're trying to do is offer something that the patient, that the customer, that the end user wants and values and thinks would be important. And I mean, that's that's the big thing I would I would ask and I would go ask them. And whether that needs to be surveys or interviews, or if you can maybe do a trial and, and test it out and, and see, make the offering. Because I've also found in my experience in business, you can ask people, would this be useful? And they'll tell you, oh, yeah, it's awesome. It's great. Oh, I totally do that. And then you put it out there with a price tag and nobody buys it. And, you know, you need to make sure that your messaging, your marketing, all that kind of stuff is is dialed in and, and, and you're you you have a plan, but the real proof is, do people use it and, at whatever price point? So we're not just talking about, oh, I you know the price is too high, therefore they won't do it or whatever. It could be free, maybe they won't use it. It could be you know half price, so maybe they won't use it. I you know you're really trying to look and see, are they gonna are, are is your patient population or another one that you're trying to reach, are they gonna get excited about the offering? And that, to me, that's kind of the, the biggest question. And then there's some stuff around, you know, due diligence and testing and making sure all the stuff works and, and you know, working with your providers and your cl- clinical staff to make sure that they understand how to use things appropriately and, and are considering all some of the things we talked about earlier to make sure they're taking good care of, of the patients and, and the people coming to them through that, through that channel and all that. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, no, it certainly is. And that really seems to make a lot of sense, really kind of gather what your audience and what, or what your population, your customer really wants and being able to kind of gather that feedback to kind of help us make a decision, I think is a really good point. So now I'm going to kind of flip the tables here a little bit, Sturdy. So say I'm a clinician and I kind of want to pitch my manager to incorporate telehealth into practice. Now, realizing, of course, that, you know, the manager is going to have certain metrics or certain things that they're going that they're really looking at. So whether that be um, completed course of pounds of care, no show cancellation rate, um, patients arrived or whatever the metric may be, you know, what are some key points that you think would be most helpful to bring to their attention to help them with their metric that they're perhaps wanting to improve? And I realize, of course, that might be a little bit different depending on what they want. But but kind of overall, what are some key points that one should bring to their attention? Yeah, there, there's a, so there's a great book called Getting More by Stuart Diamond, and it's all about negotiation. And I recommended it to a number of people, and and it's it's totally cool because the feedback I get on it is like, oh, I've been doing this, and it's really dense, and I had to take notes. And I, you know, Dwayne, who runs our our, our day to day operations and stuff here, is like, yeah, I've been through it, but I I ditched the audiobook and bought the paperback because now I'm I'm going in delving in. But the 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 reason for bringing that up is he talks about, as almost a first step, the pictures in their head. So whomever you're negotiating with, whoever you're talking to, by the way, this was an epiphany for me too, right? I tend to think kind of logically, and and of course, there's emotion and all that stuff that comes into things. You can hear some of that today in the passion and, and what have you. But, you know, if you present a logical, linear, you know, step by step case, and it makes sense, I tend to be relatively open to that, or at least I like to believe I am. But the that that idea of the pictures in their head and, and trying to figure out, okay, not only what are they thinking and what are their motivators and all of it, but bringing it all together and seeing what are the, what are what's their view, what's their perception, and how can you address that, and how can you help them to perceive the thing that that you see? Because if you're you know a clinician, you're a, a new grad and 
and you see this thing, and th- by the way, this is leading toward you know, be careful, you might be catching the entrepreneur thing, because you see you see things. You see things that don't exist yet. You know, that's one of the key things about entrepreneurs. You, they see things that don't exist yet. They start to paint a picture, and, and, and it's a- actually one of those things that the ones that can paint that picture, that can convey that message and show other people, I'm not just saying tell, but show other people what the future looks like and and how that benefits them, the patient, the customer, the company, the staff, the team, everything. I think those are the people that end up being most successful. However, you know, if you find yourself in that kind of visionary position, you you see things that other people don't see, you've got to really explore, ask questions. You know, Diamond goes into role playing, playing the other side, you know, trying to figure out what do you currently see? What do I see? And how can I paint that picture for you so you get it? And you know, the other thing about that is not everybody's going to get it. You know, you, you might you might actually be a really great artist. You might paint the picture beautifully and they still don't get it. I mean, there are people that don't like Jackson Pollock. They don't like, you know, Da Vinci. They don't like Matisse. They don't, you know, they, okay, you know, there's some subjectivity here too, and maybe that's not their thing. So can you go to a different audience? Can you find somebody else who really starts to understand and get it? But I think laying out your vision, anticipating where they are and asking questions to find out better where they are, not just relying upon your assumptions, but really drilling down and figuring that out and then painting the picture can often be quite effective. Yeah. So Sturdy, what are some of the biggest errors that companies are currently making with telehealth and maybe some of the big opportunities that they're missing out on currently. Okay. So thanks, Scott. I think, you know, tell, tell me if this is the case, but I, I think you're kind of asking companies as in healthcare providers or healthcare companies. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, some, some early adopters who are trying things out there, they're trying to get telehealth rolling, uh, but the either maybe they're not quite doing it right or they're missing the boat or uh, there's just some big missed opportunities that you see maybe growing in the future for them. So from the healthcare provider standpoint, I think sometimes we're, you know, this ends up coming down as a, a thing that, that that leader, that visionary says, oh, we're going to do, and they give it to the managers and they don't, they don't, I think one of the hazards is they may not adequately paint that picture, explain, share, define, describe the future the way they actually see it. And if you don't take the time to lay that out, I think there, there's a real opportunity for a disconnect, a real opportunity for miscommunication, a real opportunity for the managers and the clinical staff and the frontline employees to be like, yeah, this is just another harebrained scheme or thing, and I don't get why we're doing it. But I also thought about this one earlier or about things people do wrong and thinking not so much about the healthcare providers and the hospitals and the you know private practice owners and all that doing things wrong, but kind of back to that employer idea of the playing field has changed. And if you're an employer and you have a self-funded program and the playing field shifted and you're taking advice from people who used to be successful in the old playing field, I think you really need to seek out folks that can show you what the future could look like and back it up with the data, the information, the numbers, you know, the financial arguments and stuff too, because those employers have to go back to you know, different people, different constituents in their organization. They have to appeal to HR. They have to appeal to the C, C-suite. They have to talk, you know, numbers to the finance and CFOs and stuff. And and you've got, maybe this brings us back to the different pictures you need to paint for the different constituents and make sure that you're really speaking their language. So, and, and then that whole language thing also ends up, I think, being a potential pitfall for, for the end user, for the, the, the mistake companies can make in not explaining, not sharing, not communicating well to their customers, to their target customers, what, what this actually could do for you. And, you know, if you can explain the benefits, and I'm not just talking about functional convenience or financial, but the emotional benefits, the compelling reasons that, you know, why we think this is important, why we think this is important for you, what we hope you can get out of it, really tying things back to the end result as opposed to the tool or the channel, I think can be really compelling and motivating for individuals, for people who are, you know, that you need to buy into this whole model. Because you're going to have the same issues around patient compliance and adherence to plans of care and everything else that you are in clinic. You know, it comes back to communication and really making sure that all parties are bought into the reason you're doing all the things you're doing and what the end end game is, what the goals are, 
how how that patient's going to benefit, whether that's walking up and down the stairs without pain or carrying their grandkids or staying independent of their home or playing golf or soccer or something again. So I really think we have to speak the language of the people we're talking to. Yeah, Sergey, I think that's a really important take. And I think that's a really good one to bring to the audience. And you know, kind of my next question here is you kind of partially answered this before with kind of mentioning the book on negotiation. Um, but what are a few of the other books that you have been reading recently or that you have read in the past that really made an impact on you that you feel would be helpful for healthcare practitioners to read? Oh, Brandon, that's a long list. Um, <laughs> it, it really is. And I, th- and I think, I mean, that's, I was talking today with a couple of business owners and you know, this is one of those things. You can get this long list of things to do, of books to read, of what have you, and and you still have to prioritize. You still have to think about what a, what's the next step, one foot in front of the other, that type of thing. And even with a long list, it's it doesn't mean you have to read all those in the next three months or the next year. You know, particularly for the folks that are coming out of school now and what have you, how long do you plan to be a therapist? How long do you plan, you know, to be a business owner? How, you know, if I'm thinking, you know, I've already been practicing for, or I guess I'm not really practicing so much anymore, but I, I graduated from PT school over 20 years ago. And I'm in a, I'm still going to be working for another 20 to 30 years, you know, and it's not because I'm, I've messed up my retirement or anything else. It's because I love what I do and I love helping people. And, you know, that was even a conversation. We were in Hawaii one time and I said something to my wife about when I retire and she just started laughing and, you know, we're walking to the beach, I'm carrying a cooler and some kids stuff. And I'm like, why are you laughing at me? She's like, you're never going to retire. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> just it made me be quiet. I thought about that a little bit more. We walked down to the beach, we're sitting there, you know, and here we are on vacation. It's beautiful. And she's totally right. Because even there, I'm talking about work. I'm, and it, it's not work, work, but it's like ideas and how do we do this and how do we help that? And I've got a book with me and I'm reading and learning. And I, I just think... If you plan and think about lifelong learning, you, you you start to prioritize and put some of this stuff together, you can go a long way. So to more directly answer your question, Start With Why is a big one by Simon Sinek, and it's kind of foundational to so many other things. Awesomely Simple by John Spence is awesome. It, it, it's, a, it's a super cool tool that or book that has tools in it. So chapter by chapter, there's self-assessments or exercises to do with your staff. There are ways to actually implement the ideas and, and the things that, that he outlines. For those that have businesses that are a little bit bigger, scaling up can be really useful. Um, there's still things I, you know, more recently I was reading it through my fourth time through. And even in the overview, the first chapter, there were things that jumped out at me that I hadn't really gotten my head fully around before and was like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense now. So I also think if you find something that's really useful and really good, go back to it a few times. If you haven't read something that you thought was kind of impactful a few years ago, go back and look through it again. Business Execution for Results by Stephen Lynch is another business kind of structure strategy book to get stuff done, taking that strategy and implementing and making sure it happens. And I'd be remiss, I've got it sitting right here, but the saggy baggy elephant is another one. And I know people think I'm totally insane when I say that, but it's a whole lot shorter and and more entertaining than Hire for Fit, but it has the same message. It's all about, you know, finding your tribe, finding the people, the group that thinks not just like you, but shares your values and, and your motivations and your vision and stuff. And I think that's super important. You know, earlier you kind of mentioned burnout. I think the reason we go to work and who we work with and 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 what we do on a daily basis beyond just the beyond just the patients, beyond just is the facility nice or not, or those kinds of things are it's super important. And to stay in touch with the, you know, why you got involved with this and who your your community, your work community, your team, your coworkers are. All that stuff is is super important. So for those of you in management, read The Little Red Hen. Um, read If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. And again, I know you guys still think I'm totally insane, but you know, check those out and then call me and I'll, uh, I'll walk you through why they're important too. Yeah, as a father of two sturdy, I can uh, definitely get behind a lot of those uh, recommendations there, believe me. Thirty, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Some great perspectives. Uh, we like to end each episode with this last question. If you could change one aspect of healthcare education, DPT or other healthcare provided related, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? Oh, 
Scott, now I'm going to make, now I'm going to step in and make enemies, right? Because people don't like change. I mean, they, they, if something's been working for us, we tend to want to keep things in place. But I think the biggest thing I would change is really the selection process for PT schools. As a practice owner, as somebody who's been in the profession a long time, I think there are, and, and this, by the way, is not to disparage or, or or anything about the the students. I, I think the students I've talked to, people I meet at conferences and out there and uh, on campuses and stuff are inspired. And I do see some shift, but I'm talking about really opening up the, the gates a little bit and making sure that we have a, a provider population that, that more closely reflects the country, the demographics in every way, shape and form, you know, where, so people can relate to and work with you know the people they trust and and get exposure and see different perspectives as well and and more i think there's a huge opportunity to bring different people to the table with different perspectives and life experience and to share and learn from one another and that that's probably the one the one biggest thing at least in some of the programs i'm more familiar with the they're well, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. I just I think if we open it up and and had a, a bit more of an eclectic, diverse, you know, and I'm not talking about just the catchphrases and the and the magazine covers, but really diversity of thought, diversity of background, diversity of perspectives, diversity in every every other way entering the profession. I think we'd be just richer for it and and better off for it. No, I think that's a really interesting take, Sturdy. And Scott, you'll have to you'll have to check me on this, but I think that's kind of similar to what Todd Davenport said a while back too. So I don't think you're the only one. Oh, I'm sure I'm not alone. I just don't want to. I just don't want people to take that the wrong way, as if you know there's something wrong with the people that are that are in school now. If if I mean the other component that goes hand in hand with that is, let's open it up and and create more providers, bring more people in into the fold, as opposed to like. I'm not saying we should substitute and and not accept the people we're accepting now. I, th- I think it's a little bit crazy that programs, you know, have 32 people in a three-year cohort. You know, what how how can you do? How can you expand that and be broader and bring more people through that pipeline because they're desperately needed. You know, the society needs more PTs. We need more of what all you guys do. So that that's another big component. Yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting take, and I totally respect that. And you know, and Sturdy, you know, again, thank you so much for coming on the show and for you know sharing your insight. As I definitely learned a lot of new stuff um, that I'm definitely going to have to reflect on and listen to some more of this again to kind of really kind of fine tune. Because I think that you've read right, some really good discussion in here. And you know, and Sturdy, for our audience who's probably perhaps not aware, where can people find you online and on social media? Oh, sure. Thanks, Brandon. And, and number one, thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Scott, for having me. This was very thought provoking. And uh, <laughs> I I certainly enjoyed it, but it, it was uh, it, it was very thought provoking. I had to, you know, the wheel, wheels are turning, made me think a lot. So I do appreciate that as well. But yeah, if folks want to find me online. I'm pretty easy. Sturdy McKee, just, you know, Google me, but sturdymckee.com is my website, my coaching website. I'm on Twitter at Sturdy McKee. Uh, S-T-U-R-D-Y-M-C-K-E-E. So man, that's my email, sturdymckee at gmail.com, sturdy at sturdymckee.com. You can reach me. My cell phone's on my website if anybody wants to call or what have you. But uh, yeah, I, I welcome welcome questions and conversations and all as well. Thank you. Well, no, thank you, man. And you know, for our listeners who probably were thinking about before kind of with all the book names that he was going through, like, where do I find that one? Don't worry. We'll put them all, we'll put the list of all the titles and the authors in the podcast show notes for anyone to see. Excuse me. Thank you again, Sturdy, for coming on. Always a pleasure. And I wish you the best with everything, man. Keep it up. Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. Thank you for attending class today. And we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.